My name is Alexander Prokopets. Uh, I will talk about a mo new model for distributed computing, uh, which is basically a new programming model. Uh, but before I get there, basically, I want to I want to ask uh, one kind of rhetorical question, which is, what does make a programming model good? And this is a very subjective question because, unlike other areas of computer science and information technology, basically you don't have good metrics on with which to measure if a programming model is good or not. When it comes to algorithms or when it comes to uh, some kind of other formal models, basically you can you can prove something about them. You can prove their correctness, or or, or, or you can prove um, you can prove their scalability. You can compare the complexity of two algorithms. If you're talking about a system you, uh, or a framework, you can measure its uh, performance. So you can do an empirical evaluation and then say, according to this metric, this framework A is better than framework B. But when it comes to programming models, things often get a little bit more subjective. Um, Nevertheless, I want to highlight some of the properties of programming model, which people usually find useful and nice to program in, right? So one of the first, um, first properties that I want to cover and talk about a bit is that uh, a programming model should be comprehensible. And by that I mean that the programming model should be sufficiently small and simple so that people can easily understand it and remember it. And we can see a couple of examples of this. One of them is x86 assembly, which is a particular programming model. And I can show you a program in this programming model. And I guess nobody in the room probably cannot answer what this program does. And I can claim to you that this programming model, that this program outputs a particular pixel at a particular point in the screen of a particular color. But without reading these two manuals, which is the Intel Architecture Software Developers Manual, you probably can't be sure if I'm telling you the truth or not. So this programming model has a lot of instructions, a lot of special cases, and it's certainly very comprehensive, but it's not very comprehensible. On the other side of the spectrum, you have this very, very classical programming model called the Lambda Calculus, which probably many he people heard about. And this is basically the programming model which is at the core of functional programming. And what's interesting is that this lambda calculus is exactly, this, exactly as expressive as x86 assembly. So you can write any kind of program in it. But it has very few rules, unlike the x86 assembly. And here they are. Let's list them. So one of them is called abstraction. So you can write expressions, terms in this language in which Basically, you declare a variable but with this lambda x part, and then you, you declare some body which is potentially using this, this variable. And this is called abstraction, and actually, in, in, plain, in plain terms, this is declaring a function. You say, here's an argument, here's a body. Another term that you can write in this model is called application, which says basically, if I have a function, and if I have some variable or some value to apply it on, then I can call that function. And the third one is a variable. Well, if I declare the variable, then I can use it in, that, in the body of that function. And how do you, that's, so this is one question. What does the programming model look like? Well, this is it. This is how you write programs. And the second question is how do they evaluate? How do they progress? So let's take a look at a simple example where basically what you do is when, when you see a large program, you take a look and you, look, look and, and you search for these application patterns, which basically say, if I have some kind of a lambda on the left, and then I have some kind of a value on the right, then I can apply the lambda to the value. And this, on the, on the left side here, we see lambda x is x, which to connoisseurs of functional programming should be also known as a d identity function. It takes the argument and just returns it. And on the right side is some variable t or value t. And what you do here is, when you see something like this, you cross out this lambda x, and then in the body, you replace all the occurrences of x with the thing which is on the right side. And surprise, surprise, you get back a t after applying the identity function. OK, so it seems like this is sufficiently comprehensible because it's easy to explain and, and pick up. Another property that I want to highlight here is conciseness. So a programming model should be concise. And by this, I mean that programs written in this model 
must be quick and easy to understand. So it's not just the programming model, but this time it's the programs that result from this programming model. And let's take a look at how well Lambda Calculus does in this, in this regard. Here's a question for you. Does anybody in the audience know what does this program do? So since there's a silence, uh, maybe I turn to functional programming experts in the room. There's one sitting over there. Maybe Martin knows? No? Okay, it's, okay, so Adrian has uh, identified the if-then-else here. It's true, it's something that in a higher level functional programming model, you would write like this. And this basically says, if you give me a Boolean, then if it's Boolean is true, I'll return false. If it's false, I'll return true, which to most people is known as the negation operator, which you apply to, to Booleans, right? Very, very simple. So the point is, sometimes you don't want to be too minimal because it results in programs which are not concise. So you need something a bit more high level than that. So since we're talking about distributed programming models here, I want to highlight one other uh, property that, which is really important in this area, and that's location transparency. And basically, what this means is that the program must run correctly irrespective of how it is deployed. Basically, which, program, which machines, physical machines it runs on, and what are their relationships, roughly speaking. And uh, one, one, uh, uh, one programming model that was particularly uh, successful in this regard is the actor model. And here is a particular implementation of the actor model, where basically we have two things. First, we say, what is our unit of concurrency here? And that's, that's an actor, which is an independent thing that executes. And then within this body of this ping actor, we say we receive, whenever we receive a message, which is how actors communicate, so when we receive a message from another actor, say Pong, then we send with this exclamation operator called bang, the response ping to whoever the sender was. So we actually have a special dynamic variable called the sender, which tells us who sent us the message. And the way it looks like is if this unit of concurrency receives Pong, it sends back a ping. And now if we want to play ping pong between two actors, then we have to just kind of like reverse the implementation on the top, say if we receive a ping, we send sender back a Pong. And this is a very, this is usually a, a useful benchmark to look at when you're, when you're testing actor systems, how, how good they perform. And the, okay, so, and the last, last uh, property that I wanna cover in this introduction is composability. A programming model should be composable. And by this I mean programs must be, you must be able to build programs from smaller independent programs. And uh, let's take an example of that. Let's, let's study on a particular use case how well does the actor model do with in, in this regard? How, how well the programs written in the actor model compose? So let's take a very famous uh, protocol, which a product, by a protocol I mean a, an exchange of messages, uh, in, which is called the server-client model. So here, basically we have one unit of concurrency called the client, which says, sends a request to the server, server does something and sends back a response. What we're interested in is in expressing the server and the client somehow generically, as generic components in this model, so that we can later use them. And here's how we could, do, we could encode the server. Basically we say a server is an actor, which for some two type parameters T, which is the type of the request, and S, which is the type of the reply, takes a mapping function from T to S, and then sends this reply back to the client. A very simple way to implement this is by saying this in the receive. If the incoming request is of type T, we send the sender back an application of function F to this, to this re request. Okay, so how can we implement a generic client? Well, similar, it's slightly more complicated, but still r rather simple. First, we say that the client also takes two type parameters, T and S. It needs a reference to the server to which it will send the request. Then it needs a request itself. And then it needs some kind of a function, which is the action. If I receive a reply from the server, here's what I have to do. And the implementation of this is as follows. When the actor starts, 
it sends the request to the server and then waits for the reply. And when the reply receives, arrives, if it arrives, it applies the action. And that's it, these are our two main components, generic components that we can hopefully reuse. So let's take a look how we can reuse these components on an instance of a particular protocol, which is the name server protocol. This protocol, you're keeping a mapping between the names to locations, kind of, where locations are your actor references, something that you can later send messages to. So basically, what we can do is declare a map from string to actor reference, and then since this map is a function in Scala, just as it happens, we can use it in the server protocol to instantiate a new server, and then start it with a special actor of construct. It's basically for an actor template that we did previously, starts one instance of this template. This gives us back an actor reference called NS, name server, which we can send messages to. So this is it, so we reused our generic component to create a more specific component, the name server, which is a special, very special kind of server. Now, we can also, in the same way, instantiate a client. And by, with, the, with the client, in this case, we say, take the reference to the name server, and then as the name server for a particular actor reference, which is mapped under the key P, under the name P. And then when you get the answer back, then just print it to the standard output for simplicity. And the way this looks is the client sends the message P and the server responds. So it looks like our, our actor model here is composable in the sense that we were able to create a bigger pro program by composing together smaller components, namely in this case server and client, which are independent from each other. But now let's add a little twist to this protocol. Let's say that our distributed system needs to scale. And by this I mean there are a lot of clients which now want to access this name server, and this is typically the case in practice, right? You have one DNS server, but you have many people across the world asking it for, for actual IP addresses, right? So in the same sense, what we want to do, we want to cache, divide the namespace, the, the namespace of all the names, and then we want to put intermediate actors called cache, caches, which serve just parts of that namespace. So in, in particular, this intermediate actor cache should now serve just the, the, the actor reference under this key P to all the clients. So let's see how we can do this and let's, retry, let's try to use the existing components that we have. So the first thing to notice is that this cache actor itself, it is a client. Why? Well, because for, when you create a new cache actor, it is initially empty. It has some kind of state and this state is this embodied in this uh, variable C of type actor reference, it is initially null. And then when the cache starts, it should actually ask the name server for its initial value. So it should send to the name server uh, a request for this name P, and when it gets a request, a reply back, it should store it to this, to this local variable. And we can do this, so we can reuse client, and now we did this part of the, part of the story, and, and it seems like this is reusable so far. But in the next step, we have to notice that cache is also a server, because after the point that it gets some initial value of the cache, it now needs to serve its clients. And what we'd like to do is now mix in, add this other uh, class, that we, class of actors that we defined, which is called server, but we can't really do that. In particular, we can't do that because we don't have, for example, multiple inheritance, so we cannot merge these things together. We could alternatively define these two things, client and server as traits, then we could mix them together again. But the question is, they both, the problem is they both declared a method called receive. And which is the right method receive that they should receive? How do you merge them together? It's, it's very unclear. So the best thing that we can do in this situation is to say, okay, we'll override the method receive and we'll define it ourselves. And then we'll say, okay, this is the method receive. By default, it should propagate all the requests to the super receive, to the receive defined in the client. But then if the client, since it's a partial function, 
If it doesn't handle some of the requests, then you should apply the second uh, partial function, which if it says if I get a string, then I should reply to the sender, which is the client, with whatever I cached in the field C. And this is the best I can do. And the problem here is that basically I didn't reuse my generic component, which is called server. So I'm already repeating myself. And this is a very minimal example, so you might say, okay, it doesn't matter, we just repeated ourselves a little bit, but generally this server could be huge, and you want to avoid this. You really want to reuse existing components to, to, to have better code. And things get a little bit worse if we add a second twist to this cache protocol, saying that from time to time this name server may, may fail. And when it fails, we need to invalidate the cache and then repopulate it. So somebody might say, okay, let's modify this cache implementation now. And let's say, whenever I send the cache an actor reference, then this, then this an, actor, an actor reference to the new server, then the cache should again send this initial message P to the new server and wait for the response to, to actually build up its cache again. And the problem is this won't even work. Does anybody see why? Yes. It, it will receive the, the server, the, this answer from the server if, if it sends it a new request, right? But the question is, will this case even be handled ever? Exactly. It, it's already handled the super receive. Because when the, according to the implementation of the client, if this actor receives an actor reference, then the super receive will already do something with it. And we don't see this from this implementation, so we have to know something, we have to know the exact implementation of receive in the super client to know that we're not allowed to do this. And this is problematic in practice, I argue. And the conclusion here is that the actor model does not compose well. And to answer this problem, what I want to talk about after this long introduction in the rest of, uh, of this uh, talk is a new programming model called the reactor model, which is designed to address these problems. And when you're talking about concurrency models or distributed computing models, usually there are two main questions that you need to answer. The first question is how do you express concurrency in the system? So how do I say that one, one computation is concurrent to another computation? And the second question is that of information exchange. How do I make concurrent entities in the system exchange information with each other to basically synchronize? So let's take a look at the easier one, and that's exp expressing concurrency. So this is one thing that worked rather well in the actor model, because basically what we did, we extended an actor class, and by this we said everything that executes in this template should always execute as a separate unit of concurrency, and things that happen inside, they should always serialize. There should never be two threads executing code within, within, this, within this block. And this is a very useful property because it guarantees you that you will never have race conditions, you will never have data races, so you won't need to use locks and other synchronization which is error prone and, and, and often expensive. So, for example, if we wanted to declare a cache reactor this time, we would just declare like local state, same as in the actor model. For some reason, you would have an additional type parameter here, and I'm gonna cover that in a second. I'm gonna come back to it, so just, just please ignore it for now. But let's take a look at this more important and bigger piece of the puzzle, which is how do you send and receive information between, this, between these reactors? The basic construct in this model is called open. Basically what open does, it creates a pipe between the actor, the reactor in this case, and the, and the outer world, and the rest of the world. So when you call open with some particular type parameter T, you're saying, I want to send exchange messages, receive messages from other reactors in the system, which are of type T, and what I'll get back in order to achieve this is two objects. One is called the event stream, this is this first thing, and the second is called the channel. And What's important to note here is that this event stream is the reading end of this pipe. To the reactor that called open, the reactor that called open is the only reactor in the system 
that can read from this event stream. The channel, on the other hand, is the writing end. This is something that the reactor can share with all the other reactors in the system in order to receive messages from it. And shown graphically, it looks like this. So basically, you have some kind of boundary of, an, of a reactor. And on the left-hand side, you have this event stream to which you listen to events, in which you listen to events. And here, any other reactor in the system can put events in. The guarantee is that they will eventually be delivered to the left-hand side. So let's see an example of that. In particular, if you want to open a pipe that delivers string events, then we call this open method with the type parameter string. We get back an event stream and a channel. And with the event stream, we can call a special method called onEvent, which registers a callback, which says every time you receive an event, you can do something with it, for example, print it. And if, you, if another reactor wants to send particular events through this channel, then it just uses the bank operator, just as before. And if you take a look at, if you imagine a distributed system, then it looks kind of as follows. So you have multiple reactors in the system with different roles. For example, you could have a timer on the right-hand side which produce, produces um, some kind of timing events. You have a keyboard which produces input events. And then there's one channel down here which uh, sends these events to the event stream belonging to this UI logic reactor. And there's another one up here. And this is very different from what you had in the actor model, where they're basically sending all these events to the same entry point. But here there are two different entry points, and they have the guarantee that when processing events that arrive here, I will never process them within this box at the same time. So it's, it's, this is called serializability. It basically tells you that it will never happen that I'm modifying state in the on event block here and here at the same time. And this is very useful. But still, what's also useful is that these two event streams, they don't not need to know about each other. So that there can be no name clash. That there cannot be any misdelivered events coming to this upper entry point and this lower entry point. They're totally independent. OK, so this is, this is what, the, what the programming model looks like. It's just declaring a reactor and this open method, and that's it. And now let's, let's try to evaluate and see if it's good. And what we'll try to do here, I'll try to argue that this does solve the problems that, we're, that we previously saw by implementing the same kind of server client protocol in this model. So let's start with the server. The first thing that we have to notice is not, that in this particular model, we don't have the sender dynamic variable anymore. So if the server wants to reply something to the client, it needs to know which channel to, repl to reply on. So basically, when the server receives events, that is requests, from the client, he shouldn't just receive T. He should, he should also receive this channel of S, which is the channel on which it can send the, the events back. This is basically the sender. And because this type is kind of clunky and long, we can introduce a type alias for it and say this is called a request channel of four types T and S. And this time, when implementing the server, we're going to take a really different approach than what we had in the actor model. We're not going to extend the reactor uh, uh, abstract class to say that this is a reactor. We'll encode this protocol in a method. And here we'll say, Here's a method called server. You should give me two type parameters of a request and a reply. You should, you should again give me a mapping function. And what I'll give you back is a channel of this type. Why? Well, because if I share this channel with other reactors, they will be able to send me requests and the response channels. And I'll be able to answer them. So the contract of this method has to be that whatever event comes on this channel, it has to reply back with this reply on the response channel. So let's try to implement this. And the first thing that we can notice is that this screen is a little bit too narrow. But if this were one line, basically it would say we want to open a new channel. Well, obviously, if we return a new channel, we have to call this open method at least once in the in the implementation here, right? So we can. We call this open to open a new channel, which has exactly this type of events that we declared up here. 
a request and a response channel. And then we get back an event stream and a channel. And this event stream should have the property that whatever event comes in here, we have to re respond back. And this is how we write this. So now we're not using on event, we're using on match, but that's, that's the same thing. You, just, you can just put a partial function here. But it's basically the same thing. It tells you that whenever you receive a particular event, which has the request and the response channel, you can map the request and send it back to the response channel. And now that we encoded the contract of this special channel, we can just return this channel and we're done. And this is the implementation of the server protocol. Let's try to implement the client protocol. So again, we have this helper type up here. And now we're, we will encode the, the client protocol as this um, question mark method, which takes two type parameters, T and S. And then it says, give me a server channel, because I have to send this request somewhere. And then give me just a request that you want to send. I will give you back an event stream to which, if you subscribe to, you will eventually get the answer if it arrives. And again, since we return a new event stream, we have to call open at least once. And a good indication since the type is the S, which is the type of the replies, we have to call open with S. And now we have an event stream and a channel. And what we can do with that, we can use the request channel to send the server our request of type T and the channel to get the response from. Remember from the previous slide that the responses will come on this channel. That means that they will eventually be propagated to these events. And that means that this event stream is the thing that we need to return. And that's it. This is the client protocol. Now to see if this thing is really composable, let's try to implement the cache protocol, which we had trouble with the last time. And let's first think about what a cache protocol is. First, again, we're not gonna encode it as, as a reactor, we'll encode it as a method. And this method should tell us, it should basically get some information first about where the real server is, whose type is request TS. And then it should get some information about what, the re, what, what is the value that we're caching, what should we ask the server in, or, in order to get the cached value back. And this is this X. And then what we get back is a request channel of type TS, which is exactly the same type as the server channel, but this request channel will not contact with its request the main server, it will just serve back the cached values. So how do we do this? We first declare uh, some local state, in this case cached, which is just a variable of type S, which, which, has, which has no initial value, right? no meaningful value initially. And then, we use the client protocol, the request protocol that we defined earlier, to ask the real server what is the value that we should be caching. And when we get a reply back, we just say, okay, this cached field should be initialized to, to this value y. And then after that, we need to return the new, the new kind of server channel. But this server channel shouldn't be the real server channel, it shouldn't just call the real server or, or the mapping function to compute the reply, it should just always return this cached value. And that's it, this is our generic cache protocol. And notice that in this generic cache protocol, we reused the two components that we defined previously, namely the, the client and the server. And now if we want to instantiate this cache protocol in a special concurrency unit, the actual cache in our, in our name server protocol, then we do the following. First, we help our, ourselves again by saying that when we, whenever we have a reactor whose input type is something that looks like channel, channel events, basically a request and a response channel, then we actually wanna have a shorthand convenient name for it. We wanna call it the server for TS, which is reasonable. And then we can write this shorter so that it fits on this slide in this time. So we can say that class cache is a special kind of reactor, which is a server. And then in its body, we should say the following. So first of all, one thing that I, didn't, that I promised to show earlier is to explain why do we have type parameters 
with reactors when we didn't have type, type parameters with actors. Where basically in this model, you have the guarantee that whenever you create a reactor, initially the open method gets called for you once. It doesn't have to be, but we did it this way because this is convenient. At most reactors will communicate at least with somebody. So, it's, so, that, so that you don't have to write this open in every reactor, you get one for free. And uh, basically, there is a predefined main kind of channel for every reactor, which has the following type, the type that you wrote here, basically. And to access its event stream, you just call events. And this is this default event stream that come, for events that come through this channel. And now we want to forward all these events to the cache protocol. And we just instantiate the cache protocol with the real name server and the value that it's supposed to be caching. And this time, we just read it from left to right. So it says, all the incoming events should be forwarded to the cache protocol, which caches the entry P from this name server. And I argue this is, this is concise according to the previous definition. And this, this is good because it shows us that there is some potential in, in, this, in this new model in the sense that programs do compose better than what we could do before. But you know, to really prove that we should take at least a brief look at more complex protocols. So let's take a look, let's quickly take a look at one example of a more complex protocol. Let's say that we're implementing a Google Doc application. So in a Google Doc application, you have some kind of a, um, a document, and this document has certain contents, in this case, better Scala, so two lines. And now multiple uh, sites, multiple machines, they share, they're supposed to share the same Google document, the same contents. And what's important is that the same contents should at least eventually be replicated on the, at all the sites. So if this user behind the machine A makes a change to the document, then he should first update his local version, for example, by writing Java better Scala, and then he should tell the other participants, all of the other participants, that he inserted a new word at location zero, which is Java, and that they can update their own uh, copies. And this protocol, in which you're sending the same value not to one target location, but to multiple target location, is called a broadcast. And there are many kinds of broadcasts, so let's take a look at a very simple one. How do we implement the broadcast protocol? Where basically the broadcast protocol is again a method which creates, it's supposed to give you back an event stream and a channel pair, which has the property that if you send a certain event of type T to this channel, then all the participants in this protocol, all the remote sites, should receive this event, including yourself, which you'll see at, at, at this event's um, event stream that it gives back. So you can see that this broadcast actually looks very similar to open, but it takes some arguments in addition and it has different semantics. And what we actually want to give back is, is basically this layer in the application which has the following guarantees. If you send something on this send chan channel, it should eventually end up at every remote site. And if you get something from any of these remote participants, then you should get that event on this event stream as well as everybody else. And then that means that you will be able to call on event on this event stream and then in use these contents that you sent to modify your local state, which is the document, inserting the string at a particular location. So how do we implement this? Well, first we need to notice that this um, method takes a set of all the channels which are participating in this protocol. That means this targets includes all the other reactors, including ourselves. So for convenience, let's, let's assume that we have this method called find self in events, to make things simple for now, which takes these targets and returns that event stream among the corresponding to channels in this, in, in this set, which, which is our, our event stream, okay? And then we say we need to open a new pair of a send channel and an event stream. We call them send chan and sends. And then we say whenever somebody uses this send chan to send it a message, we know that this message will end up in sends 
because that's the semantics of these event streams and channels. But then we can add an additional on event on this event stream here, saying that you should iterate through all the targets and send the value x to all these channels, and it gets delivered to all of them. And that's it. At this point, we can return the things which are on this left boundary of this, of this protocol, which is events and send channel. And we're done. We implemented broadcast. And what you can notice here is there are, two, there are two layers of abstraction. There is one on the left, which is the high level view of this, of, the, of this protocol, and this is the implementation layer behind it. And this is not visible to the user. The user just thinks that this is a normal channel because this is what you return. And generally, this is a very simple form of a broadcast. And generally, broadcasts don't offer too much ordering. So for example, you could have a situation like this. This Java, zero Java message gets delivered to C before it gets delivered to B. And then C sees Java better Scala and he thinks that this, you know, the contents of this document are a little, bit, a little bit too provocative. So what he might do is then say, okay, I'll insert kind of a question at the beginning. So say, isn't Java better Scala? That doesn't sound so provocative anymore. And at this point he has to do a broadcast. So he does broadcast back to A and a broadcast to B. And now this zero isn't arrives to B even before this message zero Java arrived to B. So basically what B sees is just isn't better Scala. He doesn't understand what this means, but if he waits a little bit, he'll get basically contents, Java isn't better Scala. And now if you compare these two documents that I got, basically we have very, very different contents here. The one says Java isn't better Scala, which sounds provocative, and this one is milder on the right. And by this, B might mean that C is some kind of a troll for writing something like this, trying to, to start a flame war, right? And the point in this, in this simple example is that operations for this kind of application must be commutative. That's one solution. Another one is that messages that arrive at all the endpoints at the same time, in the same order. Not at the same time, in the same order, right? And you can think of these things as more complex protocols because what we just implemented in the previous slide is something called the best effort broadcast. It just says things will arrive at the target and they will arrive in any order at different sites. On the other hand, you have a more complex protocol which is actually much more complicated to implement and harder to implement than the previous one which is called total order, which guarantees that messages will be, will be delivered in the same order at all the sites. Another way to solve this problem is yet a third protocol called the commutative replicated data type, which says, give, I'll give you some kind of a state replica at each site for which if you update it, it doesn't matter in which, in which uh, order the updates arrive. But what, what I'll guarantee you, if they all arrive, you will see the exactly same state of each replica. And these are different protocols. And what's important to say is that the pro these protocols are all implemented in yet a simpler protocol, the best effort broadcast, which we saw previously. And we don't have time to go through them, but the analogy I want to leave you with is that this programming model is basically like this onion. Because in the middle, it has some kind of state, and that around that state, you basically have layers of abstraction, such that each layer is well-defined, and well-understandable, and composable, and at some point, when you, when you stop stacking these layers, you can say, I'm done now, and I have my reactor, and then I can build my distributed system with several such reactors, in which these protocols, different layers, are, are implemented potentially by different people, and tested by different people, and then composed by yet different people again. Whereas the classic actor model is more like this garlic. In it, there are no layers. They're just one monolithic little component. And then if you want to compose systems, you have to group multiple such monolithic components together in a somewhat artificial way by creating this envelope around them. But if you try to break them apart, this is, this is what you end up with. You cannot go further than, than this. And yeah, that's, that's basically the analogy that uh, is the most important to remember from this talk, I, I would say. So, Thanks for listening. Basically, you can find a, a, a prototype implementation of this programming model on GitHub at, at this address. 
So I welcome you to star us, tweet us, like us, share us, and, and so on. And uh, give us feedback, of course, and contributions, hopefully. And I want to thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I was just wondering if, if, we, if I would take your presentation slides mm -hmm. and replace everywhere you said channel with actor ref, mm -hmm. then how much uh, would differ? So the fundamental difference uh, is that uh, if you replace this with actor reference, and that's a very good analogy, channel basically is an actor reference in the sense that every, you could say that every actor has a single channel. It always has a single channel. It doesn't have multiple. And uh, the actors then which are not I could, yeah. yeah. So if I would use actors, I could do the same thing. If I would encode the actor refs in my messages. Uh, that's, uh, that's the thing. So you could only go that far, because you wouldn't be able to encode different protocols within the same actor, because at some point you would have to install callbacks to the same channel, to the event stream of the same channel. And at that point, you, these different protocols, they wouldn't know how to handle each other's messages or events. Basically, they, they would need to be aware of each other, not to use the messages and events which are potentially clashing in this namespace. And when you have multiple event streams, that is multiple channels, then you can use the same type of a message at two different event streams and they can never clash together. So basically, when I said composability at the beginning, I, said, I, I meant they really, they should be, comp this bigger program should be composed from smaller independent programs. But if these two components need to be aware of each other, not to reuse each other's message types, then they're not independent anymore. They have to be aware of each other. And that hinders, I argue that that hinders reusability. Hi, uh, how does this relate with uh, CSP and the Go concurrency model? Is it the same implemented in Scala or? So uh, if I know the CSP, remember the CSP concurrency model better, one big difference is that these channels are not typed, right? Uh -huh. right? Uh, the other is that basically in the, so in the, that's a, that's a good question. There, there is one difference. And that is that uh, in the Go concurrency model, which is similar to your CSP, you basically, for each of these channels, in the execution flow of the program, have to say, okay, stop now and listen to this particular channel, just one. And that means that if there are potentially different channels and different concurrently executing programs within that thread or, or within that fiber, or Go routine, how they call them in Go, then they will not get a chance to execute because you're only waiting on a particular one. So if you're a cache and you're waiting for a response from the server, then it means that the clients cannot, cannot come, they can send messages to that cache, but the cache won't be replying to them because it's not extracting the client messages. And it means again that these two protocols running within the cache need to be aware of each other. They have to somehow supplement each other and give each other a chance to execute. And that means that they're not, they're not really independent. Right? And what, what's the equivalent for selectors? When you, the selectors, you, you want to wait until any of these kind of events? It triggers, exactly. Triggers. It's, it's like this uh, figure that I showed. Basically, there are multiple entry points. And when an event arrives at some of the entry points, it triggers, but in a way such that uh, two such processing of the events at two such entry points are serialized with each other. Because otherwise you don't have a guarantee that you're not mutating the same state at the same time. So they, mm -hmm. can, they can execute whenever. They're like a kind of micro threads within the reactor, but they happen one after the other. Thanks, Alex, um, for the wonderful presentation. I think You're it's welcome. quite brilliant. Thank you. Um, 
One thought, with this cash, the first who asks will get back a null because you didn't make it wait until you get the first result from the server back. Mm -hmm. So how would you do the synchronization of multiple protocols within one reactor? Okay, so basically uh, I would modify this a little bit. So basically the thing is you say, kind of uh, implying that actor model has this advantage where you can, when you change from one receive to another type of receive, you're kind of encoding the states of your actor. Like you, you're first, yeah, ideally, in this use case that you described, you first want to wait for the reply from the server. And when you're sure that the cache is populated, then you can reply to the client, right? Uh, uh, well, yes, you have to code this um, stashing or whatever. You have to have put a bound on the number of requests you keep and so right, on. Right. You would have to implement it in either way, uh, right. in either model. So right. how, would, how but, does it work? Okay, but that's, that's a problem of race conditions. Basically, you want to avoid you, you have two choices. Either you delay the answer to your clients, or you give your clients basically a response you should retry later immediately. So you have these two choices. And I think you have to make these two choices in either model, right? Yes. So what you would do here is you would first make a request to the server, and then the server, basically this question mark would give you back an event stream to which you install your own event. And then instead of independently instantiating a server at the end of your cache, you would just put it inside this on event callback. So if I just quickly go back to this slide, uh, basically what you do is the following. So instead of putting the server here at the end, you would basically put it inside here. So after you cache, say cached equals Y, then you start the server protocol or replace it, an existing one which gives basically a retry later message to, to the clients. Any further questions? Okay, so thanks a lot for listening and I'd be happy also to take questions online.